right here. Colossians 2, 16 and 17 says, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon, a celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Yahshua. Now, I'm reading from the um, KJV. Um, I have my scriptures in front of me. Some I will read from here, um, but I'm learning with the Hebrew name, so it takes me a little bit longer to flip, and that would add even more time. So if some words are a little different, that is why. Um, but we're going to go forth. So we know that the festivals point to Yahshua and what he has accomplished and what he's coming to do. Um, and so um, the fall feast, is, which is what you know, we're currently going into, and I know that a lot of you may know these things, but what I learned is that when I talk to people, sometimes you talk like people don't know because when you assume that somebody knows something, then it sort of leaves them out there. And that was one thing I didn't like in the church because they would go forth and they would say, you know the story. No, actually, I don't know the story. So if you could take the time to tell me the story, then you know, because the chances of me, uh, or some of them anyway, picking the Bible back up once they get home is very likely slim to none and so it probably won't be picked back up until next week sometime so you need to go ahead and, and tell them the story but at any rate the festivals point to Yahshua and the fall festivals point to the things that are to come and so in Colossians right here we're talking um, they're saying that don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink referring to uh, your, your, excuse me your meat or your drink refers to the festivals and then it talks about a new moon and the celebration of, of Sabbaths and we know the new moons represent resurrection and the Sabbaths point to the establishment of the new, um, excuse me, of the millennial kingdom. And so uh, when, it's, it, when we think about the week, you know, it's six days of, of labor that we do, um, six days that we labor, and then the seventh, seven comes out the sixth, seventh is a Sabbath, but we know that those six days, when we think about the millennial kingdom, each day represents a thousand years. Second Peter 3 and 8 says that with the Lord is like a, or with Yah is, is a day, um, it's like a thousand years, excuse me, and a thousand years are like a day. So with Yah, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. So from the time of Adam up until now, it's been approximately 6,000 years of human labor, which is what the six days represent. And then the seventh day is the millennial kingdom, which is a literal kingdom of a thousand years, which is sure will reign and rule um, on uh, this earth from the promised land. Amen. So this is why, and I'm, I'm pointing this out first is because this is something that I had to learn, and it's one of the things that helped things click for me. This is why you can't be moving the Sabbath day, and this is why it can't be on Wednesday, and it can't be Tuesday, and it can't be uh, Monday, uh, because Isaiah 66 and 23 says, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, uh, shall all flesh come to worship before me. Uh, so the Sabbath, the Sabbath, excuse me, was established in the beginning. We read about it through the Hebrew scriptures and we read about it all throughout the new covenant uh, writings okay but because of religious teachings the Sabbath has been omitted um, and but when we look at the Sabbath of course we see it again in the millennial kingdom and we see it beyond the millennial kingdom um, so it, it was never the father's intention uh, to abolish the Sabbath um, it was never his intentions to do away with it it was never his intentions to move that day because when you do that then it pretty much messes up biblical prophecy it throws things off but of course a lot of people have done that and what I like to call that is religion at its finest that is what religion does Okay, so I just wanted to hit that first. Now let's go over to Levitic, Le Le Leviticus, excuse me, um, 23, 24, and 25. It says, and, and Yah spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial, a blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. And so I was looking at this, and of course, um, and a lot of times in the church, there's a whole lot of convocations, but there's not convocations at the right times, at the appointed times in the right seasons. But, uh, okay, here we are. We're not going to mess with that too much. We're just going to focus here. And so we know that this time, Yom Teruah, uh, is the coming of, um, excuse me, the, the return of the Messiah. We're preparing and we're rehearsing for the return of the Messiah. And the shofar blowing is a call to repentance. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the coming of the Messiah and the gathering of his bride. Okay, so my basic scripture is going to be coming from Matthew 24. 
And we know that during this time, Yeshua is on the mountain and his disciples come to him and they ask a question. And the question that they're asking is, what shall be, what shall be the sign of thy coming? And so Yeshua himself mentioned three signs. He said the first sign would be the appearance of the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet in the holy place of the rebuilt temple as foretold by Shaul in, in the second letter of Thessalonians. He said the second sign would be the sign of the Son of Man coming on the cloud. And then the third sign is the fig tree or the regathering of the Hebrews back to their own land. So that's where we're going to we're, we're going to go there and we're going to talk a little bit about those signs and then we're going to sit down and let you have the rest of your evening. <laughs> So we're going to start with the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. We're going to go over to Thessalonians first. And we're going to look at what Shaul had to say about the abominable, abominable, abominable one. And so we're going to 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, and we're going to start at the first verse. And it reads, now we beseech you, brethren. You know what? Let me go in here. And it says, as to the coming of our master Yeshua Messiah and our gathering together to him, we ask you brothers not to become easily unsettled in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us as if from us, as if the day of Yah has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, because the falling away is to come first, and the man of lawlessness is to be revealed, and the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called Elohim, that is worshipped so that he sits as Elohim in the dwelling place of Elohim, showing himself that he is Elohim. And so we see in this second chapter of Thessalonians where Shaul is talking, he's pretty much referring to the mystery of lawlessness and the fact that the mystery of lawlessness um, is what produces the falling away. And we know that that's already in effect today. Um, and so those that say they are believers but they are lawless, those are the ones that are subject to this great falling away. And so the, the anti-Messiah uh, or the Antichrist, however you want to say it, um, himself, of course, he he desires for us all to worship him. So what he's going to do is he becomes the law or he wants to become the law so that he can then be worshiped. And so that's where your great falling away is going to um, is going to come into play. And that's what's going to take place. Now, when you jump down to verse nine and we're going to uh, read verse nine. Um, it says, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and wonders of falsehood. Verse 10 says, and with all deceit of unrighteousness those in those perishing because they did not receive the love of the truth in order for them to be saved. And for this reason, Elohim sends them a working of delusion for them to believe the falsehood. And so when you look at that right there, um, what's going to happen is, again, this lawless one, this anti-Messiah, this anti-Mashiach, um, will set himself up as the Messiah. And we're going to look at that further uh, when we go back in Scripture. But it's telling us right here that he's going to be empowered by Satan. He, this anti-Messiah uh, is going to be empowered by Satan in order uh, to produce all types of signs and wonders and falsehoods. Um, and, and so uh, people, unfortunately, will not be able to discern because the deception will be that tremendous those that are in the falling away those that have been deceived those that didn't love the truth uh, um, they're not going to be able to discern the difference um, or, or discern the fact that this is not uh, Yah himself but that, that, that this is the Antichrist that is uh, pretending to be our Savior and so it's unfortunate that even after he comes and, and even after he performs signs and wonders um, and even after he um, pretty much uh, tricks them, that it even goes on to say, and for this reason, Elohim sends them a working of delusion for them to believe the falsehood because what? They love not the truth. 
Um, and, and so um, we know in Psalms 119 and 142, it tells us your right, your righteousness is um, righteousness forever, and your Torah is truth. So, of course, the Torah, we know, is the foundation of all scripture, and without understanding, you will not be able to interpret the scripture correctly. And then, of course, you need a love of the truth uh, um, in order um, to not be deceived. You need a love of the truth, not a love of tradition, um, like a lot of things that we see in the church, not a love of religion, like some of us in this walk that mm, pattern ourselves after the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So, not a love of religion and not a love of tradition tradition but a love of the truth and so the thing about it is is that if you don't obey uh, then you really don't believe because to say that you believe and say that you have a love of the truth and that you believe in the word uh, but don't obey the word is an oxymoron because to believe is to obey when you believe then you'll behave accordingly a lot of times people don't behave the way they should as the righteousness of y'all because they don't believe that that's who they are a lot of times you see people try to clean the fish before they catch it uh, but what we have to do is the reverse we we have to be actually believe what the word says and then once we believe it then we'll actually obey it something that I learned a long time ago is that when you consider the word of Yah then you become sensitive to it Maura Shamika I know has heard this several times what you consider is what you become sensitive to but what you don't consider is what you become hard to so if the only time you touch your scriptures is when you come in this building not per se when you enter into the Sabbath, thank you, Rabbi, too. Not per se when you enter into Sabbath rest, but when you come into this building, the only time you touch your scriptures is then, then you don't actually consider the word of Yah. And so when the, pre the teacher is up teaching and the word is going forth, it's going over your head and you're missing it and you ain't getting it and you don't understand it and you're lost and you're confused because you've never taken the time to consider it because what you consider is what you become sensitive to, but what you don't don't consider you become hard to so a lot of us have hard h-a-r-d hearts h-e-a-r-t-s your heart is hard just like the disciples when Yeshua fed the 5,000 and and they were just blown away and he's just like I don't understand what you don't understand because you've been walking behind me and you've been watching me perform all of these miracles and you just in awe it was because their hearts were hard they had never actually considered they were right there walking with the word. So what you consider. So when you believe, then you behave. So we see that this is what Shaul tells us in the second chapter about the lawless one. So let's go back. We're going to go back to Daniel, and we're going to go to Daniel 11.36. And we're going to see what Daniel says about um, this lawless one, this anti-Mashiach. Um, and we're just going to read that one verse in 36. I'm um, in Daniel 11 and 36. No, it won't here because I have it here too. And I can get to it quicker. All right. It says, and the king shall do according to his will, and, she held, and, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God and shall speak marvelous things against the Yah of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that is that is determined shall be done and so it's talking about the anti-mashiach right here he is going to exalt himself against Yah and he's going to prosper he's going to be allowed to prosper until his wrath comes so this is the same thing that Shaul is referencing in 2nd Thessalonians so now let's jump over to Daniel the ninth chapter the 27th verse again talking same prophecy right here it says and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of one week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate and so again it's referring to this anti-mashiach and it's saying that for one week 
um, in, in, in the ninth chapter, excuse me, in the ninth chapter, he's going to confirm a covenant. He's going to make a covenant with Israel. And so that one week is seven years. And so he's going to sit, um, he's going to go in the abomination of desolation. He's going to uh, present himself as the Messiah, sit at the mercy seat, and he's going to make this covenant with Israel, which lets them rebuild the temple. And he's going to allow them to begin to offer the daily sacrifices again. And so what will happen is, is about three and a half years into this agreement that he makes with them, he don't pretty much want them to stop. He's no longer going to want them to offer the sacrifices. He's now going to want them to worship him. He's going to want the Jews to worship him, and he's going to want the people of Yah to worship him. And so it's the same thing that what he's doing here is the same thing that was done uh, during the Maccabean period, which was a picture of what we're actually reading right now in Daniel and in Thessalonians and what we're going to go back and read in Matthew. And so um, it's when Antiochus, um, Antiochus, um, epiph say it? Epiphanies, yes, I wanted to say it right. Antiochus Epiphanes erected a, erected a statue of himself in the set-apart place, and he defiled the temple. So the abomination of desolation, um, the, the abominable man, is going to uh, set up himself in the temple, and he's going to defile the temple because he's going to sit on the mercy seat because it's not that he's against uh, Christ or against Yah, but it's that he wants to be him. And so for that one week, or excuse me, for those seven years, the three and a half years in, again, he's going to stop the sacrifice. Well, the Jews aren't going to be, they, they're not going to be interested in that. You're not going to stop. That. They're not going to want to worship him. And they're not going to just easily worship him. So then what he's going to do is he's going to lead a multinational military force to Israel to pretty much bust up in the temple and destroy Israel for defying his decrees. This is what's going to take place um, whenever that happens, um, when, when it talks about, excuse me, in Matthew 24, let me slow down. In Matthew 24, when it talks about the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, this is what it's referring to. He is going to set himself up in the temple and defile the temple because he wants to be worshipped. He wants to be Yah. He wants to be, and he's going to want them to worship him. But when they refuse to worship him, then again, he's going to bring in this military force to Israel to pretty much try to destroy them. But what you find out later on is that Yah, after time passes, comes right back, and he destroys that military force. But he does allow the abominable one to have his time to reign. So Matthew, we're going to go to 24 and 16, and I hope that, I hope I'm not, I hope it's, I'm making sense here, and I hope that I'm not losing anyone. We're going to jump back over to Matthew, and we're going to go back to the 24th chapter while we cover this first point about the abomination of desolation. So in verse 16 is where we are, and it's, um, well, let's, we'll read 15 again. So when you see the abomination that lays waste spoken of by Daniel the prophet set up in the set apart place, he who reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Yehuda flee to the mountains. Now, when it's talking about fleeing to the mountains, that's what we do, or that's what I've learned uh, whenever Sukkot takes place. We're rehearsing this very thing. But when we see the abomination of desolation, we're going to know then that it's time to flee. The problem is, is only the ones that have been practicing uh, the feast days and, and that keep Torah are going to know that it is time to flee into the mountains and into the wilderness. Now, we'll flee into the wilderness, and that's where we'll be for three and a half years. And in that three and a half years, there will be protection prepared for us. And um, it talks about that in Isaiah 35. If you read Isaiah 35, it pretty much tells you what's going to happen in the, de in the desert and how, you know, water is going to spring forth and there's going to be life and there's going to be vege vegetation. Um, there's no need to be afraid. But that's why it goes on to say in verse 17, let him who is on the housetop not come down to take whatever out of his house and let him who is in the field not turn back to get his garments. And woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing children in those days and pray that your flight does not take place in winter or on the Sabbath so what's going to happen is when we when we when we go into this wilderness again we'll find protection there 
but everybody's not going to make it to the wilderness. And the only way to know <laughs> that it's time to flee to the wilderness again is to line yourself up with the word of Yah. You have to prove to Yah that you love him. That's the thing. He want, the, Bible, the, the way the Bible spells love or the way Yah spells love is obedience. And so he's already shown us how much he loves us. But now it's up to us to show him how much we love him. And so like it says, if you're, if you're on the rooftop, don't go back. If you're here, don't go back. Because for some of us, some we will be able to take something. Some of us won't be able to take anything. We won't have time to grab anything, but it's okay. You don't have to fear. You don't have to be afraid because there will be protection in the wilderness. And so, again, Isaiah 35 talks further about that. So let's go back into Matthew. All right, so this is the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And even in Revelation 12, it tells you about the woman and how um, he's going to go after the woman, uh, but he's not going to be able to defeat the woman because she's going to escape to the wilderness. We know the Most High is going to carry us on eagle wings. We don't know what those eagle wings are going to be, uh, but we just know that that's how we're going to get there. And then it says that because he was unable to defeat the woman, then he goes back to make war with the rest of her seed. And the rest of her seed would actually be those who... Um, I guess are in the church and they believe, but they don't walk out Torah. So they miss that call to flee into the wilderness. So that's point one, the abomination of desolation. All right, so I'm going to jump to point three, and then we'll come back to point two. Uh, point three um, is um, the, excuse me, the fig tree sign or the regathering of the Hebrews back to their own land. And that verse says, let me find it, 32, 24, Matthew 24 and 32. And learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these, know that he is near at the door. So we're talking about the fig tree. And so what we know is that in Matthew 21, 18 through 20, in Mark 11, 12 through 14, and in Luke 13, 6 through 9, Yeshua curses the fig tree. And so we know that he cursed the fig tree because of its deceptive behavior. And so when he walked up on the fig tree, what makes the fig tree peculiar is that unlike other trees, the fig tree produces fruit first, and then it produces leaves. Whereas most trees, you get leaves, and then you get fruit. But the fig tree gives you the blossoms of the fruit that appear before the leaves. So when Yahshua sees this tree, the presence of the leaves led him to expect fruit, but it was fruitless. The tree was nothing but leaves. I'm going somewhere with this. Yom Teruah, <laughs> a call to repentance. Time for examination, time of correction, time to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. We have to think about this thing. How are we operating? How have we been operating? Are we carnally minded? Because in order to walk out Torah, you can't have a carnal mind because a Torah, or excuse me, the Torah is spiritual. So if your mind is carnal, you can't comprehend it. And so it's time for us to come to a, a, a place where we check our fruit and we figure out if we're just a tree that's full of leaves or are we actually producing fruit. See, the thing about the fig tree is the early fruit or the blossoms appear in the spring before the leaves open on branches of last year's growth. And the first ripe fruit is ready in June or earlier. The late figs grow on the new wood, and they keep appearing during the season and are ripe from August onward. And then from what I understand, the ones that are really ripe is usually somewhere around the beginning of Sukkot. Now, the unripe fruit of autumn often survives the winter and ripens when vegetation revives again in the spring. Um, now, when, when Yeshua was walking to the, the, the fig tree, 
Um, when it talks about the parables in the Bible, it was somewhere around the 1st of April, and that's when he cursed the tree. Now, the thing about it is the time of figs was not yet because they didn't ripen before June. But fig trees which have retained their leaves through the winter usually have some of last year's figs also. And as April was too early for new leaves or fruit, Yeshua, knowing this and seeing leaves on the tree, naturally expected to find some of last year's fruit. He knew it wasn't the season for figs, but the tree was full of leaves. So we have to ask ourselves, first of all, what do we do from one season to the next? Because if you're in the same place that you were this time last year, then that means you're one of those trees that's just full of leaves. No fruit. And just because it's not the, 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 the season for figs, it may not be the season. So let's, we get through this season of the fall feast. We go into the winter. That's not a season for any feast, but do we just stop growing? Or do we continue to grow so that we're prepared for the next season? Because the only way that you're going to be effective in the next season is to get everything that you're supposed to get out of this season. See, the thing about a transformation and the metamorphosis, the caterfly changes to the butterfly, but it goes through stages. But it can't skip stage three and think that it's going to automatically jump to stage six and then it's going to be this beautiful butterfly at stage eight. That doesn't work like that. So what are you doing? What have we done? What are we doing? Also, when it talks about the fig leaves, we think about the, the garden. When Adam and Eve, what did they do? do? They sewed together fig leaves. What I read somewhere is that fig leaves, fig leaves also represent excuses. So in other words, it was a tree full of excuses. Some of us are walking around here, like my former pastor said, a walking apology, a pitiful excuse for a man or woman of Yah because we're not fruitful we're not effective all we do is take up space we create problems we sow discord we have a problem with this we have a problem with that we complain about leadership we don't like this we talk about this person we become a stumbling block for our sister or our brother wait a minute we get very religious like the Pharisees and the Sadducees uh, we bog people down and, and, and bring them to a place where they, they really don't even understand if is this Torah is this not Torah what exactly, what, what's going on? And so Yeshua calls it hypocrisy. He talks about it. And he talks about it all throughout the word. He talks about hypocrisy. He mentions it so much. And so when you think about bearing fruit, bearing fruit is a phrase used to describe the outward actions that result from inward condition of your heart. Some of us need a heart transformation. Some of us need to do open heart surgery like now. Not yesterday or, or not tomorrow, but right now. Because Yeshua is soon to come. And we're in this walk. Now, I used to hear them say all the time, it would be sad to go to hell through the church. Well, it would be real sad to go to hell knowing the Torah, walking out the Torah, but still being a fruitless, unproductive fig tree full of excuses. Galatians 5, 16 and 24 talks about what? The works of the flesh and then the fruit of the spirit. It's actually a, contra a contrast or it contrasts the works um, of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. And it talks about um, the two. What the works of the flesh are. What the works of the flesh do versus what the fruit of the spirit is. And so the works of the flesh, it talks about idolatry and jealousy and dissensions and anger. But then it goes on to say, but the fruit of the spirit is love, is joy, is peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Love. Check yourself. Check your fruit. Check your root. Check your fruit. Do you have love in your heart? What kind do you have a heart of love, a heart that is wax cold, or do you have have the love of Yah in your heart. How do you treat your neighbor? How do you treat your wife? How do you treat your children? How do you treat your husband? Do you have love? Do you have joy? Do you bring about peace? Or when we see you coming, we just be like, um, go the other way. Because all she does is complains. Do, do long suffering, suffer long. Do, do you have patience? Uh, are you meek? Um, are you gentle? Um, you know, do you have self-control? Do you have temperance? 
do you display it? Or do you, are you just like a ticking time bomb? Can't say that to him, because, oh, can't say that to her. I'll use myself. Can't say that to her, because she'll go off. Can't say that, because, you know, even down to the ministers and the ones that prepare the work. Oh, I can't say that, because if I say that, that one's going to get mad. And if I say that one, then this one over here is going to get mad. We need to really check ourselves, because what we don't want to be is this tree full of excuses, this fruitless tree, and especially not in the time that we're in. We are closer than we've ever been. I've been hearing it all my life, <laughs> but we're closer than we have ever been. So we have to figure out if we're operating in the spirit. Are we operating in the spirit or are we operating in the flesh? Because you can't operate in both. The flesh and the spirit are contrary to another. They fight. Which one is it? What are you feeding your flesh? What are you feeding your flesh? And that's not in my note. What are you feeding your flesh? Because we are a spirit that, what? We're, we're in a body and we have a soul. But whatever you look at and whatever you listen to is what you feed your spirit. And then your spirit gives it to your soul. So then what happens a lot of times is we're looking at the wrong things. We're listening to the wrong things. And we're not growing. <laughs> I like certain kinds of music. I like different kinds of music. I like Beyonce. I do. I'll tell anybody. I think she's kind of dope. Now, I'm not going to follow behind her because I don't like the, the God that she serves. But I like some of her music. But my point in saying all of that is that I cannot listen to that all the time. And I really don't even listen to it that much anymore. But there are certain things that we have to be mindful of. What are you feeding your ear gates? What are you giving your eye gates? Because we always hear late in the midnight hour, y'all turns it around. Yes, he will. But if late in the midnight hour you're trying to get a prayer through and the only thing that comes up in your mind is the last thing you listened to or the last thing you heard and it has nothing to do with the word of the most high more than likely you ain't getting ready to turn nothing around because what that scripture really means is that things change when your mind changes because in the midnight hour, the only thing that really changes is the time. Nothing really changes. But when you start to think different, then that's when things become different. So everybody that sings that song, I just be thinking, I hope they really understand what they're singing. Because <laughs> a lot of times I don't think that they do. Okay, okay, but let me keep going. Let me keep going because I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. Um, so we, we're going to move on. So we, we're talking about this fig tree. This fig tree. Second Thessalonians tells us to stand fast around that 15th verse. To stand fast. And, and so in order for us to stand fast, in order for us to not be a, a tree full of excuses, full of leaves, then we know we've got to stay connected to the vine. The word tells us to stay connected to the vine. Now one more point I want to bring out about this fig tree. You have to ask yourself, if we are riping, then what kind of fig am I? Because in Revelations, the sixth chapter, it talks about this untimely fig. And Matthew 24 reference, references that very scripture as well. So this untimely fig or untimely figs are those which are not fit to harvest because they are green. And unfortunately, many people in this generation are going to be just like that untimely fig. They're going to be harvested out of season. You remember it said, uh, pray that your flight doesn't come in winter or on Sabbath because that's out of season. Well, a lot of people are going to be harvested out of season by the Antichrist because they are lawless and because they are fruitless. So let's jump over to Revelation 6, 12 through 15, because I want to look at this really quick. Um, it, and Revelation 6, 12 through 15 uh, coincides with Matthew 24 and 29. Let me read 24 and 29, and then I'll read Revelation 6. So 24 and 29 says, And immediately after the stress of those days, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give its light, 
and the stars shall fall from the heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. We're going to stop right there. That was 29. All right. Now, Revelation 6. And we'll start at verse 12. And I looked when he opened the sixth seal and saw a great earthquake came to be. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of the heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its unripe fig. Some Bibles say may untime, say untimely figs, being shaken by a strong wind. Now, what it's talking about in Revelation 6 is the sixth seal, and we know that's when the Antichrist, well, excuse me, that's when, when the sixth seal opens. How do I say this? What the church says is the rapture, this is actually what's taking place, which is where you don't want to be. <laughs> there is no pre-tribulation rapture. That doesn't exist. There's nothing that's going to take, allow you to take wings and skip the tribulation period. The only ones that won't go through it are those that make it to the wilderness, like it says in Matthew 24. The ones of us that keep the time, the feast days, uh, and when we, you know, rehearse the cult, when we make it to the wilderness, then we will, the rest of the world will be in turmoil. The Antichrist will be running loose, and you'll either take the mark, or you won't eat, you won't buy, you won't sell, you won't do nothing. You take the mark, or you die. You take the mark, or your wife dies, your children dies. You take the mark, or if you're pregnant, they're not delivering your baby. You don't take the mark, I guess you're just going to bust. I don't know. But if you don't take the mark, then there's nothing you're going to be able to do during this time. And so what Revelation 6, Matthew 29 said, immediately after the days of those tribulation, uh, the days of the, the, that tr of the tribulation, Revelation 6 and 12 says, and when I look, he opened the sixth seal and saw a great earthquake came to be. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of the heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its unripe figs, being shaken by a strong wind. These are those that they, they now realize, <gasps> that's the, that is not the truth. <laughs> we just got caught up. Like they sing that song, I want to be caught up, caught up in the rapture. That's what they're going to be doing right there. I stopped singing that song alone. Man, when I figured out, I was like, yeah, nah, I don't, don't want to. And they tear that song up in church. I mean, they go to the rap, like they go up and they, they change notes. And the sopranos be in the rafters and they be caught up in the rapture. I mean, they and they go in, and they tear the church up with that song. I don't want to be caught up in no rapture. And they, you ain't sing, nah, y'all y'all good, y'all good. But this is what's happening. So the stars of heaven are Satan and his fallen angels. The thing about the green figs is the green figs are not easily shaken from the tree. So it's a great wind that harvests these green figs out of season. So the question I ask you to ask yourself is how easily are you shaken? And what does it take to throw you off balance? Are you going to be like this untimely fig? Because if you go further in Revelations, it says, And heaven departed like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the sovereigns of the earth, and the great ones, and the rich ones, and the commanders, and the mighty, and, the, and every slave, and every free one. And it should say in the church of God in Christ. And it also should say the, the Methodist church, and the Catholic church, and, and the um, <clears throat> Baptist church, and um, the Jehovah's Witnesses um, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him sitting on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, because the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand because now what they realize is oh my god do you know it's going to be some mad people they're going to be so embarrassed because in that moment they will realize oh my goodness we just missed it we missed everything the pastor said was a lie yes Yes, 
Let the word of Yah be true and every man be a yes. That is what's going to dawn in that moment. Oh, my God. But it'll be too late. And what you want to make sure is that you don't get caught there either. Because just because you're in the walk doesn't necessarily guarantee your ticket. There's still things that you have to do. Your behavior makes a difference. Your behavior determines whether you get to the wilderness. You got to get there by any means necessary, but your behavior is what gets you there. So we can't take that for granted. I can't take it for granted, but I do thank the most high that my eyes have been opened. So you have to ask yourself, how, how are you shaken easily? Are you shaken? I think James, uh, in the first chapter, he talks about being tossed or, or, or to and fro, being, you know, wavering. And the fact that a double-minded man is unstable in all this, his ways. We have to ask ourselves, are we double-minded? Uh, do we waver here? One day we're here. The next day we're over here. Uh, one minute we're mad. The next minute we got joy. Uh, one minute we're sad. The next minute we don't know if we should say hey or bye. I mean, or what we should say to you. These are the things that we have to think about. Out. Because these are the things that determine our behavior. And these are the things that determine whether or not we're actually producing fruit. Because we can't be fruitless. Because if he cursed the fig tree it, because it was fruitless, then we certainly can't be. And unfortunately, I have ran into, I have come across a lot of people since I've come into the knowledge of the truth that think that everything is okay. Uh, because I know Torah, no, that's not, no, it still doesn't make everything okay. There's still a certain walk, you have to walk a certain life, you have to live. There's still certain behavior that you have to have. So how easily are you shaken? And then when you think about the works of the flesh, now it says it. I didn't say it, but Galatians 5.21 says, those who practice such, out their names, all of those works of the flesh. And when you break the works of the flesh down, it's interesting because there are things that I didn't even know that some of those words mean. But that's probably another teaching for another day. But it says, those who practice such as these shall not inherit the reign of Elohim. So it means if you're not operating by the fruit of the Spirit and you're operating under the works of the flesh, it says that you will not inherit the reign of Elohim. Some Bibles say, some Bibles say you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So I'm in Torah, I keep Sabbath, I keep the feast days, but I operate in flesh. You shall not inherit the reign of Elohim. And the thing about Yeshua is he doesn't tolerate false appearances. Again, the fig tree had an appearance of fruitfulness, and it was false. The essence of hypocrisy, as I said. Like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. All right, so let's go to our last point, which is our second point, but it's our last point, and then I'll be done. The son of Adam coming on the clouds. So this is after we, we got through the abominable one and we made it to the wilderness because we are not the fruitless fig tree. We have fruit. We are effective and we're excited and we're waiting and we're going through that three and a half years and the rest of the world is going crazy, but we're protected. And then this happens. Verse 30, Matthew 24 and 30, and the sign of the son of Adam shall appear in the heaven and then shall all the tribes of the shall all the tribes of the earth shall mourn, and they shall see the son of Adam coming on the clouds with power and much esteem. And he shall send his messengers with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his chosen one from the four winds, uh, from one end of the heaven to the other. Let's jump over to back to Thessalonians, and we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to finish this up. 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to start at, we're going to be in the fourth ch chapter, and we're going to pick up at the 13th verse. So Matthew 24 tells us the son of Adam comes on the cloud. This is why we shout. This is why we rehearse what was being done earlier. This is why we blow the shofar. This is why we get excited. I'm excited because the more I stood it and began to understand that I think I said this a couple of Sabbaths ago. Y'all, for a long time, I was scared to death of death. 
It's like, I don't want to die. I mean, I know I got to die, but I don't know if I want to die because I don't know what happens when I die. I mean, I know what happens if I live um, and Yeshua comes back, but when I die, like, what happens? Like, you know, what? It, I was, like, really afraid, and mainly because of what I've been taught and the fact that I haven't been taught the truth. But after learning more and more about Yom Teru and learning about Yom Kippur and learning about Sukkot and, and the last days and, and being in Revelations, this is why we shout. This is why we blow the shofar. This is why we get excited. This is why we have a joy that the world didn't give and the world cannot take away. This is why we celebrate like this. This is why, uh, and I know I ain't been in as long as some of y'all, but I'm saying we, hey, I'm just glad to be here. This is why we celebrate like the scripture tells us. Because we know something that the world does not know. And so now that I'm no longer ignorant to the scripture, um, and 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 um, excuse me, I don't I don't have a hard time. I don't now that I understand what I understand about the feast, the fall feast, Rosie will I will always see her post and say, the most wonderful time of the year. And so I think about the time of the year that I always thought was the most wonderful time in the year, and just every the feelings and emotions attached to it. But really, when you get to understand this thing, it's like, how can you not get excited about the feast? days so for you all that have been in this walk for so long y'all should be jumping for joy like how do you not get excited about this time how do you not get excited about Yom Teruah and all of the other fall festivals are you not for people that don't not get excited it's because they don't understand the word and they need to get in their word if you gonna walk this walk walk it if you gonna walk walk if you gonna you know what they say um 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 this talks and everything everything else walks but if you gonna walk the walk then walk it to the fullest why live beneath your privilege why cheat yourself out of everything that you get and that comes along with walking this walk get in the word understand the word get a revelation of what it is all about and when you get that revelation then you're able to rejoice and it really will be the season of your greatest joy when you truly understand what you're celebrating it will be the season of your greatest joy so First Thessalonians 4 13 says now brothers we do not wish you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep lest you be sad as others who have no expectation others that have no hope we have a hope but there's a whole lot of people out there that don't uh, the denomination I came out of there's millions that don't get this that don't understand this don't even know what Yom Teruah is ain't never heard have no understanding but the word says that um don't that don't don't excuse me do not see we do not wish you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep lest you be sad as others who have no expectation for if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again so also Elohim shall bring with him those who sleep in Yeshua for this we say to you by the word of the master that we the living who are left over at the coming of the master shall in no way go before those who are asleep because the master himself shall come down from heaven with the shout with the voice of a chief messenger and with the trumpet of Elohim and the dead and Messiah shall rise first then we the living who are left over shall be caught away uh, together with them in the clouds to meet the master in the air and so we shall always be with the master so then encourage one another with these words now let's say let's look at this it says that we're going to meet the master where we're going to meet him in the air the air does not mean that we're going up into the sky to those that say that the air just means we're going to meet him where he is the atmosphere of wherever he is is where we will be and and there we will reign with him wherever he is is where we will be it doesn't say suddenly we end up in heaven and that's it that is a religious doctrine that I'm glad I don't believe anymore <laughs> But it says we'll be caught up to me. It doesn't say we'll be caught up in the rapture. It says we'll be caught up to meet him in the air. So we're going to be gathered from the, for the, from the winds of the earth like it says in Matthew 24. And so we shall be with the master. Where does he go? Because I always thought we just floated away in the clouds. 
But we go to the land that he promised us. That's where we're going to go to be with him. When he gathers us together, then we go to that land where he promised us, and then that's where we reign. So what I learned is that Sukkot rehearses the marriage supper of the Lamb. Again, those of us that make it in the wilderness period. Now, there are going to be people that make it through the tribulation. It will be some that actually make it. It's going to be those that make it. Talk about that 144. That they're going to make it. Um, through the, through the tribulation. So they're going to be with him as well, but I don't want to go through the tribulation if I don't have to. I want to be in, I, I'm sorry, and I, I, don't, I want to be uh, in that place of safety. I want to make it to that place of safety. And so when he comes back to gather us, y'all, this is the gathering. This is when the bridegroom comes to receive his bride. And that's something to be excited about. Just like on your wedding day, on some of your wedding days. I ain't going to talk about my wedding day, but on some of your wedding days, I hope as a bride you are excited to see your bridegroom coming. As excited as you were on that day, we'll be that much more excited on this day. And so the Bible says a shout um, and the voice of the archangel, that is very loud. That's like thunder. That, that, is, that is, this morning, y'all, it was thundering. And, and because I know the word, I knew it wasn't time because there's still some things that have to happen. But if I didn't know, I bet you it was a lot of people like, oh, oh, I think he's back. Because the thunder was so loud and it was rolling so hard, it shook my house. But my point in saying that is that when Yeshua comes, just imagine when he comes back and the archangel shouts and the blast of the shofar takes place, that's going to be very loud. I mean, and it's going to get louder. You think about when the Almighty delivered, um, I think when he delivered the Torah to Moshe and he had the people to gather around uh, the mountain and they began to hear uh, the sound of the shofar blasting and and then it just got louder and louder that's what we're looking for that's what we're going to be waiting for that's what we're rehearsing for right now the shouting the blasting knowing that we're going to be gathered together knowing that the bridegroom is going to come back to gather his bride but he's got a uh, he's coming back for those that are without spot and without wrinkle so I'm done on this evening I hope you got something out of it I'm excited about Yom Teruah you should be excited I'm most I'm excited about Yom Kippur I'm excited about Sukkot I'm excited about this time this call to repentance I'm excited about rehearsing for the second coming of the most high I'm excited about the fact that I know I'm not going to be caught in a rapture I'm excited about the fact that I know where I'm going whether I die in Yeshua or whether I'm still alive whenever he returns. And so we got to get to a place where we check ourselves, y'all. Or you can blow the shofars because what we don't want to do and what we don't want to be is that leaf, that leafful tree, that leafful fig tree. Don't let him come back and catch you like they used to sing with your work.